let's talk about significance testing. So um, this is a technique that's used all the time in statistics, in science and engineering, um, and it has some caveats and it's important to know how it works and when it makes sense to use it. So remember in binary hypothesis testing, we had two hypotheses. So we called them H0 and H1. And from that, we got an observation Y, and it was generated either by the um, conditional PDF under H0 or the conditional PDF under H1 in the continuous case. And what we were doing was using this Y to decide whether H0 or H1 had actually occurred. And we used, for instance, the ML rule to decide H1 if when plugging into these likelihoods, we saw that f of y given h1 was larger. In significance testing, it's a bit different. So we only have an explicit probability model for the null hypothesis h0. We don't have one for the alternate. And based on our observation y, we can only decide whether to reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. And at this moment, you might be thinking, why not just call this fail to reject accept the null hypothesis. And this language is just there to remind us that we don't have that much information about the um, world that we're testing here. So we only know that under the null hypothesis, we have a model for you know what something looks like. And if we get a measurement that looks pretty different from that, um, we're gonna say the null hypothesis doesn't make sense. And if we get a uh, measurement that does agree with it, we say, well, for right now, we're going to stick with the null, even though it really may not be the case. We have no way of knowing, but that's what we're going to do now. We're going to fail to reject it. You'll get used to it. Here are a couple of examples. So let's say you deploy two versions of a website, A and B, okay? And you're just showing them to different users randomly as they show up to your website. And the null hypothesis is that the mean click-through rate is the same, all right? And this is something that's actually happening all the time now. So even um, if you go to different websites, when they have headlines, they might show you different variations of the same headline throughout the day. And then they'll stick with the one that's generating the most clicks. Um, as another example, let's say you administer a new drug to a group of patients and a placebo to a control group. Okay, so this is really common in testing drugs. And um, the null hypothesis is that the mean cholesterol, let's say you're trying to lower cholesterol, stays the same. And maybe, you know, something that you would want to see is that the new drug lowers cholesterol, right? So that would be when we're rejecting the null. And finally, let's say we have a reactor and we want to make it more efficient. So we change the temperature of that reactor and we measure the yield of the reactor's product before and after the temperature change. And the null hypothesis here is that the average or mean yield is the same at both temperatures. Okay, so what we need is a significance level alpha, and we're gonna use this to determine when to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, specifically what we're gonna do is calculate from the data some kind of statistic. We'll see how to do that in a little bit. And that statistic will give us a p-value, which is the probability of observing a value of the statistic that is at least this extreme under the null hypothesis, right? So what we're doing, so just think back to that um, cholesterol lowering drug, let's say it lowered the cholesterol by 10%. So then we're calculating the probability under the null that the cholesterol is 10% or even lower than that. That's kind of the high level idea. And so when the p-value is less than our significance level, we reject the null. And when it is uh, greater than or equal to the significance level, we fail to reject the null. And okay, just to remember this, you can think about this as accepting just to get used to it. That's why it's in green, but it's really fail to reject because we don't want to strongly endorse the null, even in this case. And in practice, the significance level is often something like 0 0.05 or 0 0.01, but it really depends on your application. So we now introduce four significance tests for the mean. Okay, so we're just gonna focus on the mean in this video. We're assuming that under the null hypothesis, our data is basically IID Gaussian, or that this is a pretty good approximation. Um, you can kind of see from these tests when, what we mean by good approximation, if you're averaging a bunch of data, it tends to look Gaussian through the central limit theorem. 
So if that's an effect, this is probably a good assumption. In a one sample test, what that means is we have a data set and we're comparing its mean, its sample mean really, to a known baseline mean mu. And in a two sample test, we have two data sets and we are comparing their means to each other. You can think of a control group um, and a test group, and we don't really need to know the means in advance, okay? So one thing to keep in mind with these uh, p-values is that, let's say we set the significance level to 0 0.05, that means that 5% of the time we're gonna be rejecting the null hypothesis, even if it were really true, because the null hypothesis can generate those kinds of um, observations with 5% probability. So, you know, that means that when this is applied to determine whether a drug is good or whether a headline makes sense for a website or a temperature makes sure for your actor, 5% of the time we're going to be wrong. So just something to keep in mind. So a one sample Z test, that's when we are given a data set. We'll say it has N points X1 up to Xn. The null hypothesis in this case is that the data is IID Gaussian or well modeled, well modeled by that with known mean and known variance, okay? And our question informally, right? So informally, what we're wondering is, does the mean of the data that we've gathered differ significantly from the baseline that we know mu? Okay, and the way that we do this is we calculate the sample mean. So we know how to do that. We just average the data. Then we calculate this thing called the Z statistic. Okay, so it's root N times the sample mean minus its mean divided by the standard deviation. And we calculate the p-value. And the nice thing about this Z statistic is that it is Gaussian distributed, right, if the data is Gaussian. And so what I'm doing is calculating the area that the null would have generated an observation at least as extreme as my own, which was Z. So I'm looking at minus absolute value of Z and plus absolute value of Z, just to make sure I get both the left side and the right side. Those are the two extremes I could have seen, that much more negative or that much more positive. And so if that p-value is less than alpha, I reject the null. And if the p-value is greater than or equal to alpha, I fail to reject the null. And in practice, you see people using this test in scenarios where you have about n um, greater than 30, even if you have to estimate the variance from data. And we'll see that, you know, strictly speaking, there's a different test for that. But the reason is that basically everything kind of converges to Gaussian in this regime if the samples are independent, thanks to the central limit theorem. And so if you collect 30 or more than 30 independent samples, even if you didn't know they were Gaussian in advance, it's a pretty good idea to use this test and people do it all the time. Um, but we just need to know that the assumption is this Gaussian assumption. Okay, so what about a one sample T test? So there, again, I'm gonna have a very similar scenario. There's only gonna be one change. So I have a data set that's n points. I have data that I think is IID Gaussian, and I know it's mean. I know under the null, the mean is mu, but I don't know the variance. That's the change from Z to T. And informally, I ask the same question. Does the mean of the data differ significantly from the baseline mean mu? Okay, so I wanna know the same things. I just don't know the variance. So the way I'm gonna deal with this is I'm gonna calculate the sample mean average the data, I'm gonna calculate the sample variance. So I'm gonna take this one over n minus one and then sum up x minus the sample mean squared. Then calculate what we call the t statistic, which is basically the same thing except standard deviation gets replaced by square root of sample variance. And I calculate the p-value using the CDF of a t distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom. And this should be familiar to you because we saw the same distribution pop up in the confidence interval case when we divided by the square root of the sample variance. And so finally, we get a p-value, it's less than alpha, we set that threshold in advance, we reject the null, if it's greater than or equal to alpha, we fail to reject the null. And in practice, um, you tend to see this used in scenarios where you have very few samples, so say 30 or less, and it's reasonable to say that data is pretty well approximated by a Gaussian distribution, Right, so the central limit theorem may not be in full effect here. So you do wanna know that your data is kind of Gaussian. If it's very different from Gaussian, maybe you wanna come up with a different test.
So what about a two sample Z test? Well, now I'm gonna have two data sets. I'm gonna call them X1 up to XN1 and Y1 up to YN2, meaning that the data sets may be of different sizes. The null hypothesis is that both these data sets are Gaussian with the same mean mu and possibly different variances that since it's a Z test, we're going to say that we know these variances, sigma one squared and sigma two squared. The mean does not need to be known. We don't know the mean. Okay, but we assume under the null they have the same mean, and we're just asking, do they really have the same mean? So think about a, um, you're giving a drug and a placebo. That's what this is about. So we calculate the sample means. So we take the sample mean of the first data set, we'll call that M N1 based uh, with this one index, and then M N2 with this two index. Those aren't powers, those are just indices. And we calculate the Z statistic by taking their difference and dividing by this effective variance here, right? So if you were to calculate the variance of the difference of these things, if they're independent, then this is the variance that you would get. And you take the square root to get the standard deviation. We calculate the p-value again. It's going to be the same thing because the z statistic is again under the null going to be Gaussian. Same argument. And again, we compare to alpha, reject if it's less than alpha, fail to reject if it's greater than or equal to alpha. And in practice, again, very reasonable to use this in scenarios where um, we think the central limit theorem is going to be in fact, so we have about 30 samples per data set, or really more than 30 per data set. Even if we estimate the variances from data, that's kind of okay. All right. And finally, let's talk about the two-sample t-test. Okay. The two-sample t-test, again, same data setup as before, two data sets, possibly of different sizes. The null hypothesis is going to be almost the same, except on the null here, we're going to say they have the same mean and the same variance. So now sigma squared is the same for both. And we don't know sigma squared because it's a t-test, but it's equal across the data sets. The mean, again, is unknown. And what we're asking informally is do the data sets have the same mean? Formally, we're just asking whether to reject the null. So what we do is we calculate sample means, Okay, just like before, we average the data sets. All right. Now we don't know the variance, so we're going to calculate the sample variances. And so we do that. So we do that for one data set. We do that for the other data set. And now because we think the variance is the same, we're going to pool together the sample variances. And this is how we do it. So we're going to take the scaled sample variances divided by n1 plus n2 minus 2. And it turns out this gives us a t statistic. If we take their difference, divide by the pooled standard deviation, square root of this factor, and we can calculate the p-value, noting that this is the t-distribution with n1 plus n2 minus 2 degrees of freedom. And again, we just accept and re sorry reject or fail to reject the null based on the same criteria. OK, so this scenario is useful when we believe the variance is to be the same, even if we don't know them. If the variances are different and we don't know them, there's something called Welch's t-test. We're not going to go over that. And there are also lots of other um, tests designed for scenarios where we think the data is correlated. Um, those are paired tests. And there are lots of other things you can do, like trying to test whether the um, data you collected does come from a certain kind of distribution. And you can look those up. So basically, there are a lot of these kinds of significance tests available for um, scenarios you might be interested in when you're collecting data.